Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to you wherever you're joining us from. I'm Andy Tobin, Evanim's European Managing Director, and I'm delighted that you've joined us for our most popular webinar to date. Um, if you're new to these sessions or new to self-sovereign identity, you'll find plenty of previous webinars at evanim.com slash webinars. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, really good sessions on SSI for education, um, a really good one on uh, digital credentials for organizations and also the topic of safe credentials. So there's plenty there for you to have a look at. And uh, today we've got a really good agenda for you. Uh, when most people hear about self-sovereign identity, they automatically think of identity-based use cases. For example, digital versions of a passport, a driving license, an employee ID card and so on to prove who you are. But identities just one use case for this new technology. And whilst it's the most obvious, there's much more depth to the underlying capabilities than you might think. Uh, one of the brilliant side effects, uh, if you can call it that, of SSI is that you get advanced authentication capabilities included. And that's what we'll be talking about today. Uh, my guests today are Chris Eckel from Condatis and James Monaghan from Evanim. Uh, so Chris, could you do just a, a quick intro of yourself, please? Yeah, hi. Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm Chris Eckel. I'm CTO of Condatis. We are based in Edinburgh in Scotland, and we are an identity company helping companies to simplify identity, really. And we've been working with Evanim as an Evanim partner to make SSI easier for our customers as well. Cool. Thanks, Chris. And James, over to you. Thanks, Andy. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's James Monaghan, and I'm the head of product at Evernim. Uh, I'm based here in London, but I think uh, many of you know Evernim has a uh, has a global team, uh, even more distributed these days. Um, but it's been my pleasure to be collaborating with uh, with Kandatis over the last couple of years on, on a number of initiatives, and we're really excited to share this topic with you today. Cool. Thanks, James. Um, now, a quick reminder, um, if you needed one, we do record all our webinars, and we post them up on evernim.com slash webinars. Um, usually a couple of days after they finished. So uh, watch out for this one coming in there if you want to watch it again. We usually get loads of questions during these sessions. Um, so feel free to post your questions in the Zoom Q&A. Um, don't use the hand raising thing, just put it in the Zoom Q&A, not in the Zoom chat. Uh, we'll gather them up and uh, Alex will collate all of them and we'll cover as many of them as we can do um, after we've heard from James and Chris. Uh, just before we start um, the, the formal bit, there's a couple of announcements uh, for you just to go through. Um, Evanim's credential exchange platform, Verity, provides all the SSI tools that you need for your business. And our version two release now includes our SaaS Verity server deployment, our Verity SDK, and our new REST APIs. Um, we've created a new sandbox plan for you to try it for free. So if you want to do that, please go and check out evanim.com slash plans to take Verity for a spin. We've also got a super webinar coming up on July the 30th. I'm really looking forward to this one. Um, it's a leap into what's called the mirror world. Um, it's how digital credentials can be used in virtual worlds and in gaming. And this is going to be huge. So, so don't miss that one. Um, so without further ado, let's get into authentication. Um, so uh, login accounts have been described as the accidental actor in computer security. When computers were bigger than refrigerators and accessed by terminals with green screens, uh, security was just like it was for everything else. You'd have a door to the room with the computer in and you'd have a key for it and so on. But when they moved to a more network model, physical security just wasn't possible. So um, computer-based access controls were created. And uh, thank you, Sherry, I'll speak close to the mic. Um, computer-based access controls were created and the username and the password were born. Uh, this model seemed to work and whenever a new service was created, the answer to the security question was always, let's give them a username and a password. So each service would implement things differently. And you'd have eight letter passwords here and another one needed special characters or numbers and another thing needed strange questions about your dog and another required a physical dongle of some sort and so on. And it's a painful parties involved. 
Um, the average employee has something like 191 passwords and businesses have to pay like $70 every time they do a password reset. So there's a lot of pain and cost involved for everybody in the, in the whole ecosystem. Um, so another workaround to the workaround was developed and that was putting a third party in the middle of your interactions called federated login. And the third party would handle the login hassle. It would make it feel much easier. You'd log in with Facebook, for example, and you could access lots of different services through that one login. And then you have to ask yourself, why would they offer a service like that? You know, why would Facebook want to sit in between you and every digital relationship you have? And I think we kind of know the answer to that one now. Um, the additional problem is that you have to trust this third party. Rather than peer-to-peer -peer trust, which is how things work in the physical world, you now have an intermediary to trust as well. And that makes things difficult. And we wouldn't really accept it in the physical world. You know, if you get to the immigration counter at the airport, you hand your travel documents to the Facebook employee who's standing there who copies them all and then hands them to the, the, uh, the border officer. You wouldn't kind of do that in the physical world. But because there hasn't been a better way, this workaround has, has been normalized. So if we get back to basics um, here, back to you know, where this all came from, what if a different decision had been made about how you, you interact with, um, with computers and how you authenticate yourself? What if there was a better way that meant you, you didn't have to log in at all? And that's what we're gonna cover today. Now to understand a bit more detail about why this can be done now, um, Let's do a quick recap of self-sovereign identity or SSI. Um, SSI is built on three pillars. The first one is the ability to make secure, private, peer-to-peer -peer connections with anyone or anything without any intermediaries. The second pillar is a, a new way to digitally watermark data. So that data or parts of that data can be shared privately and securely by you under your control. And this is achieved using existing digital signature technologies implemented in new ways. And when you combine these two pillars together, you get the ability to have the private exchange of data between two parties. And those parties could be people, organizations, or things. The third pillar is um, a place to store public keys. Um, it could be any storage medium, but it's a place where issuers of credentials, digital credentials, place public keys that verifiers can use to verify those credentials are authentic. Um, it has some characteristics, ideally, like highly tamper resistant. It's not run by any one organization that could turn it off and it's chronologically ordered. And those are the characteristics of distributed ledgers. So it's, it's no surprise to see distributed ledgers involved in these architectures. And the third pillar allows you to verify that the connections that you're making, um, <coughs> excuse me, and the data that you're exchanging are authentic. And brought together, these three pillars make up what we call self-sovereign identity. The technology um, behind SSI, like decentralized identifiers, verifiable credentials, and the protocols that bring them together, essentially create um, what we call a technical trust tunnel between two parties, whether it's me or you, or me and my employer, or me and the airline, this technical tunnel ensures that the data I put in is what comes out at the other end. It means there's nobody in the middle who can intercept it and change it or scan it or see everything you're doing. When the other end receives that data, they can check the authenticity of the data themselves instantly without needing to contact the issue of the data. And they can do four checks. They can check who issued it? Has it been changed? Was it given only to the person presenting it? And has the issuer revoked it? And this is a huge leap forward. Um, the technology under, underneath it and the, the code is all open source. So anyone can build on top of it. It's not proprietary. But there's another kind of question sitting in here as well, which is, oh, there we go, um, that this technical trust tunnel isn't enough you still need to have human trust in the source of the data. And without this, you can get garbage in and verified garbage out. 
So it's not just about fancy technology and amazing cryptography. You need to have human trust as well. So what you need is um, a digital trust ecosystem. Um, and this has been recently codified in the trust over IP stack, which I encourage you all to spend some time on because it is awesome. Uh, this framework describes all the components needed to make a digital trust ecosystem work. And there's nothing miraculous here. Um, a lot of components uh, already exist. Your bank already has rules to decide which utility provider's monthly statements to trust as a proof of address, for example. Your country has decided which passports to accept at the border. So these rules already exist. The Trust Over IP framework lets you translate uh, these existing human trust relationships into digital trust. Um, and it ensures you've got the rules in place to make sure you know who's at the end of this technical trust tunnel. So we've got some amazing new technical capabilities and a way to combine them with human trust to build entire new trust ecosystems. So the question then is, what does this mean for authentication? So James, over to you. Thanks very much, Andy. You posed the question a few minutes ago of, of why do we need to log in at all? And uh, hopefully for our audience, now that you've explained some of the underpinnings of self-sovereign identity, um, I think we can all see that the idea of relying on things as trivial as usernames and passwords is a bit quaint now we've got these new digital superpowers. Um, fortunately, self-sovereign identity allows us to do away with both uh, traditional usernames and passwords. The venerable usernames, such as an email address or a Twitter handle, they're convenient, they're easy to remember, um, and while you often get to choose them, usually you don't actually control them. They belong to the service provider, like your ISP or your, your social network. And because you rent them in this way, uh, it's very convenient to reuse them across services, which means actually your behavior gets tracked across all those different places that you, you might want to authenticate. In contrast, uh, decentralized identifiers are created and managed by the individual themselves. They sit in a digital wallet that you control. This means you can create an unlimited number of these because you never have to handle them yourself. Your, your wallet does all that for you. They don't have to be memorable. They don't even have to be human readable. Each one of your different relationships can therefore be truly independent. And that's, that's the real superpower behind the approach that Andy was describing earlier there. And replacing passwords with cryptographic keys vastly increases the security. Not only are they prohibitively hard to guess or crack, but if one of the service providers you interact with was to uh, get compromised and say their whole database gets, gets leaked and posted online, the one verification key that they store for you can't actually be used to impersonate you. It can't be used to log in on your behalf. It's only valid for you, specifically you to log into specifically that, that one service provider. In fact, even if someone was to able to compromise your private key, because you use a different one for every one of your relationships, even that would not give them the ability to go ahead and compromise all your other accounts. So as you can see, replacing usernames and passwords with a self-sovereign digital wallet that contains these decentralized identifiers and cryptographic keys, it offers both a more secure and a more convenient experience than the legacy approaches. Another area where self-sovereign identity can have impact is in multi-factor authentication. This is the practice of using two or more factors to increase the level of assurance behind authentication. Often it's some combination of something you have, like an access card or a certificate or a physical device, something you know that might be a password or a pin code, and something that you are, which could be a, a biometric match, like a facial likeness or, or a fingerprint. Um, using an SSI wallet manages to bring together a number of these elements together in a really powerful package. Using a connected device, you've got the physical authenticator that there's something that you have, but it's got superpowers. It's always on, connected to the internet, and so you can use this to get real-time consent and to actually exercise some control over the authentication itself. The use of cryptographic keys associated with your decentralized identifiers lets you prove strongly the ownership of a particular account that's yours, and you can store them securely in the uh, secure element on that mobile device. Verifiable credentials that come from trusted third parties let you prove things about yourself, such as your name or date of birth, or even your membership to a particular organization, according to a mutually trusted third party. And by being equipped with a camera, a fingerprint sensor, other biometric sensors, um, typically a digital wallet can also bring that real-time assertion that the person holding the device is the same person that was enrolled for the service. 
And so this combination gives you both security and convenience that goes well beyond traditional two-factor authentication. So those are some of the general principles behind using self-sovereign identity for authentication. Uh, now I'd like to walk through some of the specific methods that can be employed. The first and the simplest is just DID authentication, in which you use the private key that belongs to the uh, decentralized identifier that you have to prove that you are indeed the rightful owner of that account. It's the classic passwordless login use case, similar in many ways to schemes like FIDO, except that DIDs give users that extra level of control. Remember, you generate them yourselves, they're not assigned to you. You can rotate your keys whenever you like because they're decoupled from the identifier themselves. I'm sure many of you have experienced login flows like this. It's often initiated by scanning the QR code or clicking a link that arrives via SMS or on a mobile website or something like that. And as Andy mentioned, that the beauty of this trust tunnel is that you get this essentially for free by adopting a decentralized self-sovereign identity architecture. It's actually by far the simplest method of authentication that you could, you could implement. A variation on this theme is the combination of these modern DID authentication techniques with the familiarity of the older and more established OpenID Connect standard. So OpenID Connect is actually the approach that Andy was maligning earlier in terms of uh, federated identities. And this is the same standard that providers like Facebook and Google use to make it very convenient for you to sign in using the identity that they hold for you. But it also includes a so-called self-issued profile, which allows individuals to act as their own identity provider. Now that never really caught on um, much over the last decade because it was prohibitively complicated for users to administer that. But now that we have self-sovereign identity, it's eminently possible for you to act as your own identity provider using a digital wallet. And so in collaboration with a group of, uh, of other companies that are part of the Decentralized Identity Foundation, Evan and others have been working on showing how you can use uh, the self-issued profile of OpenID Connect in conjunction with these fully owned and controlled DIDs to uh, bring together the best of those both two worlds. Now those two examples were mainly focused on authentication in the context of a, of a login scenario. But uh, the beauty of self-sovereign identity is that actually you've got this persistent connection between yourself and the service provider that you can use long after that initial exchange of details. And so um, one of the common use cases we see for using that messaging channel is actually to ping the user um, at some other point to do either an out-of-band authentication where they're not sat in front of a, uh, a web screen or scanning a QR code somewhere, such as being on the phone to a call center, for example. Um, we've got a customer in the credit union industry that is using this to skip the 20 question knowledge-based authentication that is required when you call in and, and prove who you are. Instead, they're able to send a simple yes, no challenge response message down to the user that says, hey, is that really you that's on the phone to this support rep? The user can tap yes and move straight on with their business. But of course, it can be used for much more than a simple yes or no. You can actually gather um, arbitrarily complex responses from the user. Um, this example shows a simple multiple choice question that could be used for a step up kind of knowledge based channel challenge that's in addition to uh, the proof of possession of a DID. But you could use it to ask the individual um, specifically which ATM they're standing in front of or um, what their first pet's name was. It's, it's really up to you. The, the beauty of this approach is that every response that you send back is cryptographically signed using that same key that belongs to your DID. So the service provider that you're communicating with knows uh, with very high confidence that it's really you. But then the, the fourth and the most powerful method is the um, one that uses verifiable credentials. This, rather than just using a, a, a DID, which as we explained at the outset, is specific to your one relationship with one particular service provider, um, the whole purpose of verifiable credentials is to take something that one entity knows about you and be able to securely and privately prove those things to another service provider. And so this capability allows you to authenticate anyone, anywhere, using attributes that they're from a mutually trusted provider. So you can think of this as encoding the details that might be on an access card, on a government issued identity, uh, on a membership document, or, or really any of these traditional form factors, but giving them a whole bunch of new digital superpowers that go along with it. This means you can authenticate a user across domains, whether they are technical domains, like just two different systems which don't happen to talk to each other, 
whether they are physical domains, so I've got a, an online access and I've got a, a physical building access, for example, or even uh, just different trust domains. So a common example is you've got a federation of um, partner organizations, for example, that are all technically separate companies and they run their own separate user databases, um, but they want to grant certain privileges to each other's employees or, or stakeholders, for example. Uh, using verifiable credentials lets you do this in a truly decentralized way. You don't need a single central repository of who all the users are. Um, you can offer a single sign-on um, that lets the user carry with them the authentication and authorization rules that are relevant for their use cases. And of course, it can be more sophisticated than that. It doesn't just have to be the equivalent of your username and uh, which department you work in. It can be biographical and biometric data, such as a photo and things like that, which can both provide personalization of the service and a higher level of assurance as you're matching the, the physical likeness to the individual who's authenticated. And so the power of verifiable credentials is uh, like all great powers, something that brings with it uh, great responsibility. Uh, at Evanim, we believe it's really, really important to employ what we call a safe credentials approach to sharing information like this. Um, just because you can um, use the same identifiers um, and move them around really, really easily using this infrastructure doesn't mean that you should. And in many cases, it would actually be quite toxic from a, a privacy and therefore a usability use case. By employing credentials, we've been able to break that, that binding that meant single sign-on had to mean a single username everywhere. And so this way, you can avoid unintended correlation, these digital breadcrumbs that would automatically follow you in every one of your additional interactions. It also avoids the, uh, the devil's bargain of all or nothing. Either you're authenticated and trusted or you're some unknown out there that's just faced with a login screen. Um, by being able to employ selective disclosure, so only revealing certain attributes that are relevant to a transaction um, and using zero knowledge signatures that mean I'm making these disclosures in a privacy enhancing way, we can establish context appropriate trust for every step of the customer journey. So that means I don't have to interrupt a user at the very beginning of a purchase by collecting 13 fields of uh, verified credit card and address information, for example. I can gradually walk them through the process of, of learning enough about them to allow them to complete that particular transaction. And what that allows you to do is model in the digital world a lot of what we do in the physical world, which is build pro trust progressively as the relationship develops. And so that we think is gonna be key to unlocking a whole load of new, and really compelling user experiences that don't compromise security at all, but bring additional flexibility and privacy benefits. So um, now that we've seen that the technology exists and, and how it works, um, I think the next key step is to deploy it into real world existing systems. Um, and it's at this point that I'd like to hand over to Chris, the CTO of Condatis, who's been doing exactly this and can tell us more. Over to you, Chris. Thanks, James. And, and thanks for splitting it up in those different ways of layers of authentication, really, from simple key exchange to an attribute exchange. But coming back to the trust that actually happens in, in identity. I said Condatis deals a lot with traditional identity problems and we do a lot with federation and federation isn't just the bad Facebook login. You know, we federate in our enterprises a lot, you know, look at your login to Google or Office 365 or, or other use cases. And there's a strong trust between the identity providers, you know, the enterprise identity provider or Facebook and its users, it know, you know each other. And there's also a trust relationship between the services and the identity provider. And, and those trust relationships are paramount to identity. Only by those trust relationships, the trust that the identity provider has to see users actually transferred to the relying party or the service. We, in, in the traditional federation world, the service we call a relying party. And that's important because the relying party needs to trust that the user turning up on, on their side is the user they want to give access to. So that bilateral arrangement between the identity provider trust to the relying party and the relying party also knows which identity providers provide user information 
who they can trust for user information, whether that's a government identity provider or an enterprise or even Facebook. Now I get some information about the user that I need to be able to trust. That, that's a two-sided relationship. In the SSI world, that relationship changes a bit. The people who issue credentials still need to know their users well to issue the credentials. And that's what uh, Andy was talking earlier about this human trust factor. You know, I, I can only rely to that strength of that issuing process. So I need to know my users and issue and have some trust with the users. But to transfer the trust of that to the verifier, is actually this relationship of the verifier uh, based around the verifier now that the verifier trusts some issues, but the issues do not know the verifiers anymore. So uh, in, in, in this case, for example, we could have a, an example of a shared office building that houses a lot of different organizations and the issues of those staff passports that all people coming to the office are all the organizations within the office. Now, the, the company who does the security in the office can't really easily keep track on, on every system what issues they can trust. What are the decision points to allow somebody into the building? So, since they don't have a federation with everybody uh, as a security officer, they can easily uh, codify a trust framework in form of what credentials do I trust? What issues do I trust? What do I ask in form of the credentials? What do I want? Do I want the picture of the person so it can validate it's the right employee that allow in? So that encoding is what we help uh, our customers with to, pro to provide that in an encoded trust framework that then can allow access to a building or even to the relevant floor. And another use case in the same uh, vein would be actually access to a system. So again, this office management system might have meeting rooms that you can book, but how do you allow this booking of the meeting rooms without federating identity uh, and access to that booking system to every single company in the building. Again, with a verifiable credential and, and as James showed earlier, with that I can have on my device, I can just scan a QR code to make a connection. I can just then selectively release some data. You know, I'm the office manager. I'm allowed to make room bookings. Uh, I, I work for this company who is in your building. I selectively allow some data out. The system can validate that it's one of the companies they trust and therefore grant access to a room booking system. So this right trust framework that brings it together is, is something that is paramount here. And, and that's com a combination of what James said earlier, you know, just logging in with a key because I am coming back in again or logging in with some attributes out of your credential. What we as Condatis uh, did is we have an OIDC bridge, we call it, as part of our SSI offering that really combines old and new world. So to the relying party, this is a standard OpenID Connect, an, an identity provider that service can just use as, as a trust anchor. And that identity provider then does all the, the clever stuff uh, that Evanim offers or other SSI provider offers behind the scene to connect to a wallet, to connect to credentials that's coming from some issuer, ask the right information about those credentials, know which issues to trust, uh, knows the translation between the request of the relying party and what proof request template I need to use and also check when the data comes back from the wallet to say, well, I asked for a role, but is your role actually office manager or is, is your role uh, uh, just a, a developer, you know, and who has rights to do certain things. So that translation can all be abstracted 
And then that means for an enterprise to have a one trust point uh, that they can use. So if you go to the next slide, Andy, what it is, and, and this is repeating this in a more technical diagram, it's an OIDC request between the relying party and our bridge. And to the relying party, it is just this bridge. And the bridge obstructs all the communication with the wallet, whether that's the, a QR code generation to connect or to have a proof request or validating that proof request. What we also are able to do by abstracting it in this way is plug in other systems like an authorization system where we can, with that information that we get back from the attributes, address other systems and come back. Quite often we use Microsoft technology in there. You know, Microsoft Azure Active Directory is a good way of abstracting that one level further. But you know, this is what we work out with our customers and produce a solution that works on, on a bigger scale. So as an overview, yes, thank you, Andy, uh, is our offering consists out of a middleware that abstracts the underlying SSI technologies, whether that's Evanin or, or Microsoft or other SSI providers. And, and we have services that can issue those credentials simple, can validate those simple. We have our OIDC bridge and we have a handshake provider that allows us to negotiate between those different uh, technology stacks underneath. And so we can enable this for our customers in a very simple way. And you know, some of the use cases on the top you see is staff passporting, you know, for government employees or health and care staff. And, and that works quite well on that technology already. So that's great. Thanks very much, thanks Chris. For um, giving me time for that. Yeah, back to you and James. Yeah, very good. Yeah, so I'll just take this quickly and then uh, throw it back over to James. So, so essentially, what you're what you're doing is you're you're abstracting the technicalities of um, of SSI and all of the protocols and enabling it to integrate into existing identity systems. So you're kind of extending, uh, enhancing those identity systems to be to be SSI capable, right? Is that that's essentially what's under the skin? Is yeah. that right? Yes, yes. So it, it's that abstraction layer to make it simpler and offer interoperability and package it up also as an organization because an organization doesn't want to encode a different trust relationship with every of their services. They want to manage it centrally. So as yeah. an enterprise on government, you want a central management platform where all your trust frameworks are prescribed and then you don't really mind whether it goes to SSI or to the more traditional uh, your employee login, but you know the SSI in, extends your employee login to those loosely uh, connected organizations. That that that's the beauty about crossing those domain boundaries, as James called it. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so I think that's a really important concept to get across: is that you know no one's going to just turn off all of their existing identity schemes and just suddenly deploy. An SSI thing, right? It's it's an evolution and an enhancement approach. Uh, and I know there's some stuff you can't talk about, Chris, that you're doing at the moment. I can't talk about it yet. <laughs> um, uh, but James, you can tell us about some uh, stuff that's being used live at the moment for this very for this very purpose, right? Yeah, no, it's 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 great to have uh, have real production use cases that that we can reference because a lot of times when you when you talk about self sovereign identity, it sounds like you're describing the future, and and you know a lot of Early adopting organisations are fairly cautious when it when it comes to talking publicly, um, but it's it's lovely to have examples uh, of, of customers who are who are loud and proud about this. And um, you know, one of our partners, uh, CU Ledger, is working with a number of credit unions on deploying um, self sovereign identity based uh, authentication for a whole handful of use cases. Um, and they've on their website actually you can go, go look at it. They've got a number of um, really compelling customer testimonials. Um, I, I picked this one because it really exemplifies what we think is, is the, the best benefits that um, self-sovereign identity-based authentication can bring. So here we have the, the president and CEO of Unify Financial Credit Union, who says, our members are already embracing this new method of authentication and sharing their excitement with our team. Now, whoever described being excited by the simple process of authenticating with your, your financial institution, but actually, 
most of us associate nothing but pain with that process, right? So what a transformation this represents. He goes on to say, we've been told that the enrollment process is simple and quick and that they feel more secure when calling into the call center. So there you've got both the convenience, the, the superior user experience, um, plus you've got the security that you need when, when truly deploying a mission critical uh, enterprise solution. So we think that's tremendously exciting. Um, and uh, we know that call center authentication is just one of the scenarios that, that credit unions are, are looking at this for. In fact, Unify is also working to deploy this uh, inside their branches so that they can offer a fully contactless experience for their customers um, and therefore avoid a number of the risks associated with uh, handling physical documents and ID cards um, amidst the current pandemic. So we're really excited to be able to, uh, to share that example of a, of a true production use case that's reaching scale. Yeah, and it's uh, it's a high high assurance use case in a you know financial services situation, isn't it, James? And uh, as it happens on chat, I'm just seeing uh, Julieta uh, from MemberPass. Uh, well, see you ledger behind MemberPass is actually on. She says, uh, "Yeah, um, I got three thousand live credentials. They only started just you know a few days ago, um, and people are using it all the time now, and people are enrolling really quickly. So this is happening." Um, we got this this really nice high assurance use case um, in the financial sector, and normally it's been a, a kind of trade off, hasn't it, between um, uh, between convenience and security, right? You could never have high security and high convenience. You have high security and really poor convenience, you have really high friction, or you could have you know, an excellent customer experience and the security would fall through the floor. But now you can have you can have both, right? And it's not really been possible before. You can have a really simple user experience. Um, and for member pass, you know, it's from minutes to seconds for authenticating people with really high security as well. So that's a, an excellent example. Um, so thanks for that, James. Um, loads and loads of questions coming in. So we're going to uh, switch from the more sort of formal presenty part to the bit that everyone seems to really like, which is when they get their questions answered. Uh, so I, and I give uh, I give the guests a really tough time. <laughs> so we've got a pile of questions coming in um, already, and uh, if you've got any more, please drop them into the Q and A. Uh, wow, well, there's quite a lot already. So uh, drop them in there for us, please. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, we'll stop sharing the screen. There we go. Uh, so you can see us big style. And uh, actually, let's kick off um, first one for you, James. So a question come in. Uh, how does this new approach relate to FIDO Alliance standards? So other authentication related things. Um, do you want to take that one? Yeah, absolutely happy to. Um, yeah, so so the FIDO um, uh, UAF is a is a quite a popular um, passwordless authentication standard, and it's it's got uh, you know some pretty prominent backers. A lot of major browsers support it, major handset manufacturers, um, and also there's you know, separate physical tokens that you can get. Um, so it's it's really quite quite powerful, um, and it's certainly I think the the uh, best known example of a really widely deployed. Um, uh, password, passwordless authentication scheme, um, and you know, under the hood, yeah, you know, we you know we use different families of, uh, of cryptographic keys and, and signature suites and things like that. Um, but it's it's fairly similar. It's based on the process of enrolling um, a key that that you, the user, possess um, with a uh, with a service provider that you want to authenticate to, and then subsequently proving uh, possession of that key. And what what FIDO gives you is a uh, a whole protocol suite for doing that. Um, and they certify the uh, various different actors, so the, the, the companies that make the authentication tokens and devices and things like that, which is critical to establishing the necessary trust framework, which is a point you made at the, at the outset, Andy. Um, so, you know, in, in many ways, they're quite similar. But using a decentralized identity approach um, just makes a couple of slightly different assumptions to FIDO. Um, number one is uh, in FIDO, the uh, service provider is responsible for the key lifecycle. So if you want to enroll um, a, a new key, if you want to change the key using things like that, um, you know, you can only do that at the service provider's behest. Um, and the second is that uh, the key itself or the fingerprint of the key um, is your identifier. So you can really only have like a one-to-one -one mapping with, with an enrollment. Um, and so uh, if you were paying attention earlier, you'll see the differences that DIDs bring in, right? Number one, 
the IDs decouple the identifier from the keys. You could have multiple keys um, on each of your devices, for example, um, all of which let you prove that a given DID is yours. Um, and number two, um, you control that binding between the keys themselves and the identifier. So um, if you get a new phone, um, you, can, uh, you can authorize that to access the same DID um, and you don't have to necessarily go through a process with the, um, uh, with the service provider themselves. So that, in, in that's the, not... Yeah, I was just going to say, in the, in the authentic... In the authentic <laughs> I love Zoom delay. Um, in the authentication message, though, isn't it on the FIDO, it's kind of binary, is it? It's yours, it's not you, but um, with a credential-based proof, for example, with a, with a credential-based proof, for example, you can pass all sorts of other information as well. So it's not just a binary yes or no. Would that be a fair statement? That, it, it, exactly right. So I, I answer that mostly in the context of uh, DID authentication, um, but it is that one-to-one -one binding that's the most uh, limiting factor associated there. So using a credential, you can take um, a trust from one domain and bring it into the other domain. And, and FIDO doesn't really have a mechanism for doing that at all. Got it, cool, okay, that's a, a good um, differentiation there. Okay, so we'll come to you next, Chris. So uh, it's a question from Projfile Belagavi. I hope I've got that one right. Um, does it eradicate the use of a server database? Chris, one for you. Well, it, it does uh, in a lot of cases. So, so remember that diagram, you know, the credential comes from an issuer to a user and the user now holds all the data you usually would hold in a database that an identity provider holds. And the user gives you the data just in time. So it, it's very much a user controlled data that you get when you need it, rather than holding a database. Rather than, you know, uh, James mentioned the the problem with losing credential databases as well, that also goes away. There is no credential database that you need to hold on a server that could be lost. So it takes a lot of, uh, a lot of those risk factors and, and attack surfaces out of your system if you don't need to hold those user data and you just get it in time when the transaction is needed. Yeah, so the, the issuer still has to know who their employees are, right? If it's an employee database, but they still need to know who their, 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 um, the people are they're issued to, like the passport authority is not gonna delete their database of all the people they've issued passports to. So the issuer still needs to know, but the verifier is just in time. And I guess the verifier can delete the um, information they get once they've done a transaction if they wanted to. Yep. Yeah. As long as they keep the, the did base connection, they can always ask for it again. So I, it's, it kind of changes the so, way it works. It becomes so easy, doesn't it, to, to ask for a proof again that you, you can change your business process. And, and, and your business process is really that underlying driver. You know, some business process mean that you need to hold some audit information and, and some government use cases is, are clearly like that. But you don't need to hold it in a live database that is, is nearer to the user and therefore, uh, you know, easier to be lost. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's cool. Thank you. Um, here's another one. Uh, this is for you, James, from uh, Jorge Flores. Um, the examples presented assume the user is accessing the relying party system from a desktop interface and therefore is able to use their mobile device to scan a QR code. What's the login access flow for when the user is accessing a service directly from their mobile device? So it's actually, um, it's actually even simpler. So I, I happen to think um, QR codes are ugly as sin. I mean, they, they have a number of benefits over using passwords, but I, I physically cringe uh, whenever I encounter one in my daily life. Um, but they are, at the moment, they're one of the easiest ways to sort of bridge that gap between the physical and the digital. Um, if you're already on a, a mobile device that has, uh, has the mobile application um, installed on it, then it's actually very easy. You can initiate that flow by clicking a, an application deep link that exists on our mobile web page, that's embedded in another application that you've got, um, or that arrives via an SMS text message, for example. And that's actually how a number of our customers are um, doing the enrollment process for this, is they're bootstrapping that initial DID connection um, by sending a challenge down using one of these existing challenges, like uh, channels, like an email or an SMS. Um, and then from there, they're kicking the wallet into action. So um, in many ways, it's a, it's a much more seamless flow um, it's just slightly less interesting to put in a slide because it's underwhelmingly easy. Um, so that's, that's why we don't show that example. Yeah, and this is one of the things, isn't it? It is uh, it is really simple um, when the, the user experience works. Um, and 
on that sort of topic, just about organizations issuing credentials, uh, just uh, one for you, Chris, from uh, Jacques Bikundu, I believe. Hey, Jack, how you doing? Um, this question is, uh, is quite a goodie um, because it's directly related to, to some of the rollout stuff that you're working on, Chris. So um, in your experience, what would it take for an organization to become a trust anchor or to, to start offering credentials? You know, what does that need to, for that to happen? It doesn't need a lot. So you need to define what's in your credentials. So whether you have a staff access uh, ID or a passport, you need to just define the data set you have in there. So that's a bit like when you define your relationship with an identity provider. And once you have that, you register that as a credential definition. And you then can, you can with the help either of, of Evanem or one of their partners like Condatis, have a service that just issues those credentials. Now, what Andy was saying uh, earlier is really important. You know, the, the, the strength in the credential lies in the enrollment. So how do you know you issue the credential to the right user? James, you were saying, you know, sending an email to something known. So a known communication channel you already have open or after some identity proofing, as bad as it sounds, but the QR code on screen after some identity proofing sometimes is the right approach. And it actually, yeah, and it could be in person, couldn't it? You, you could be in front of the person. They they say, yeah, here, like when you get your employee badge or whatever. So there was another question. Somebody was saying, um, will will the organisations that issue current physical credentials will they just issue digital versions of those as well? And mm. I think the answer is probably yes. So, yeah, so, so one use case we have, for example, is we can issue credentials right out of Active Directory. So if you're an employee of us, you go to Active Directory to a portal there, log in with your Active Directory accounts, multi-factor, whatever is set up, and you get a conducted staff credential right out of Active Directory with, without anything else. So it's right. stuff that HR has onboarded about you, the pictures, your role, your rights with, within group memberships, and you transfer that into your wallet and now can use it with partner organizations. Yeah. I and mean, one thing that's really cool about this is that once you've got some credentials, um, like employment credentials, for example, or passport credential, let's say you've got a passport credential, you use that to be able to get a job. The, the employer can then give you a credential and then you can use that then to log in. So it's not just about identity. It's once you've got something from your employer, that then becomes a login token for you to use across all their systems they don't have to knit them together anymore and, and yeah and, and one of the cool things coming back is once you shared your attributes out of the credentials so you did that proof that james was talking about and this other partner organization now knows about you they actually have a connection with you now so you, the next time you go to them it becomes far simpler and it can be just as the ceu ledger example says you know is it you you're wanting to log on and you say yes, or it might just be sc scanning a QR code and in you are. Yeah, so this is what I, I you found can like, track that. Yeah, I, I found that this is like too spooky, you know, because we're so, we've been trained to use usernames and passwords. And when we were going through this, um, it was a couple of years back actually, it was like um, our, our CTO said, oh, you can just get rid of usernames and passwords. And I, I just couldn't understand it, you know, because we're trained to think that way, but your username is just a, a kind of, it's a bit like a credential. You know? <laughs> so getting rid of usernames and passwords and just saying, look, it's me coming back. So I've got the thing you gave me that only I could present back to you and I can prove it. Let's yeah. get rid of the username as well. Um, and, and so often, Andy, that's, that's all that's important, right? Like we don't, we don't need to assume that we're strongly identifying users in every one of these scenarios either. A lot of times it's enough to know I'm the same human being you dealt with last time. Um, and that's that's enough, right? I've cleared sufficient uh, boundaries so that you know I'm not a fraudster, I'm not a, a, a bot or a sim farm or something like that. Um, but you don't yeah. need to store a load of personal information that's going to bring with it regulatory and data processing obligations that might be completely irrelevant to delivering a service to me. And so yeah. that's a big part of the trend, I think, as well towards passwordless is, is towards accountless registrations, frankly. And so it's it really does support both ends of that trust spectrum really nicely. Yeah, perfect. We, we inherit some of the attributes of those devices as well. So the mobile devices, most of the new ones have biometric in some way, shape or form. And that biometric protects in their trusted execution environment. So, so that secure chip on the device uh, protects that, those keys. 
So there is some natural biometric uh, protection patterns that protects your data. And when you issue, at least you've been the same person who got the credential when you present that credential to somebody else. I, you can put further assurances on as well that you can embed the image of the person in the credential, right? So, so when someone rocks up and says it's me, you can look at them and go, well, yeah, that is you. Uh, so you can, you can step it up as well. Okay, let's move on to a question from Paul Loberman. Hi there, Paul. Uh, nice one here. How does gov.uk verify fit into this model? Um, are they the best issuer of credentials, particularly given that they saw a huge increase in registration as people needed to access universal credit during COVID? So I think you'll both have something to say on this one. Hit, hit James up first on this one. Yeah, sure. And and so and for those who for those who don't know, um, GovUK Verify is a, a national uh, identity federation um, that was stood up here in the United Kingdom a few years ago um, that brought together uh, a number of um, third-party identity providers from industry uh, to be able to onboard users, um, and then uh, individuals were able to use this for a handful of, of um, government use cases. Um, and the the short answer is, um, I think they'd be a fantastic issuer for. For the UK ecosystem, um, you know they've got a well-established trust framework with uh, strong guidelines and well-understood levels of assurance. Um, and you know, as as you made the point, Andy, with your talk about trust over IP, um, that's in many ways the more important half of the stack. People talk about the technical stack a lot, and uh, you know, I, I I think some of the shortcomings of, of Verify were to do with um, the, the use of a, you know, of a, a, centra, a federation rather than a, a completely open, um, interoperable, decentralized stack. But the key to enabling that trust is the, the trust framework. Um, and that's a really well thought out scheme that they have in place. So, um, so personally, I would, I would love to see that. I think it would be a huge shot in the arm for the industry. And Chris, I don't know what you'd add to that. But. Yeah, 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 absolutely. The, the federation was okay as well because other European governments manage that federation. Actually, mm, I think the true. complexity of onboarding of relying parties and services uh, was the complex bit. But, you know, one of the things, if they would want to look at it, is issuing verifiable credential, it would be far easier for services to onboard than they currently have a a system that has double encryption in SAML with the central hub. It, it, it's awfully complex and we've, we've yeah. helped government departments on board and, and it, it is a pain. Yeah, another thing when you link up like gov.verify, gov gov.verify UK, etc. Verify.gov. Anyway, when you link that up with um, the IDAS in Europe, for example, you've got hubs upon hubs that will have to connect to each other, right? Um, what essentially the identity providers are doing is they're, they're checking who you are and they're creating a credential, but they're holding onto it and giving you a username and password, right? Wouldn't it be great if, as well as doing that, they just gave you a credential and then you could carry that and you're the courier of this verified data. You carry it to the other country where you're going to register as a student and you can prove who you are. You don't need these hubs in the middle that someone has to run and, and uh, operate and cost money and so on. Um, so yes, and, really, yeah. Really, yeah well. Chris? Sorry, yes, those identity providers in, in Gov UK have two reasons, you know, A, they give identity, you know, they prove your identity and B, they keep that data. But the only thing they would need to do is prove that identity because you would be your custodian of your own data once they've proven it. Yeah, and in fact, maybe it's another, um, stand in because what are you showing them? You're showing them government issued documents, right? So when the government issues you credentials, then you've got those golden documents. They're already digitized. Okay, let's um, move on. And just by the way, uh, we've got four minutes left, but as always with these, we've got more questions than we can handle. So we're going to run 15 minutes longer. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, thanks for everyone's patience. Still, still got loads of people on, which is fantastic. Um, Okay, so let's cover actually this one. This is for you, Chris. Um, we sort of alluded to it a little bit earlier. Um, it's from Elias Pogeman. I hope I've got that right, Elias. Uh, which is the biggest challenge when implementing SSI in an organization? So we talked a bit about integration, but do you want to talk about some of your recent experiences with um, maybe some of the non-technical stuff? 
Yeah, it, 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 it's the user experience, you know, uh, getting that issuing a, a valid a verification processes right and, you know, making, making it simple also for the techies. You know, that there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of complexity around the, the whole dance around getting the SSI and, and, you know, yes, it's new, user experience is growing and, and it's coming, but, you know, we're usually there, you know, Evan and Condatis, all our partners are there to help the user through this process. And once the learning is happening, you know, user learned how to use, uh, you know, mobile phones and so, you know, this, this is very simple. Yeah, you know, people don't realize if, they, if they're using, if they're using WhatsApp, right, they're, every relationship they got on WhatsApp, they're managing keys there that they don't know. And that's the, that's the key, isn't it? Um, well, yeah, we get, yeah. get the question all the time, Andy, right, about, you know, why do, do users really want to manage their own identity, right? That's, that's the other thing, it's, it's this, this mindset shift. But, I mean, what's in your wallet right now? What's in your filing cabinet? I mean, it, it's actually, it's not so burdensome managing a small handful of, you know, widely accepted credentials. Um, and if they have digital superpowers that let you use them remotely, um, that, that actually is, is the best of both worlds. And so I think, I think that's the way to frame it in some of these conversations is to, to think about it that way. Yeah, yeah, what do you do in the real world? And mm. um, in fact, the, you know, often the first question we're asked, uh, and there has been one asked in here as well, is you know, what happens if you, if you lose your phone? And you could flip that round and say, well, what happens if you lose your wallet or someone breaks into your house and steals your filing cabinet? With digital credentials, you can back them up, you can recover them, you can put further protections in there. Um, so you, you get a lot more flexibility than you do with physical credentials that we're, we're all comfortable with. Um, quite a few of these questions, by the way, they're, they're kind of, um, there's a lot of people asking about things that aren't specifically authentication related. So I think maybe we'll just go with that and I'm going to throw another one out. Um, Marcellus Figueroa, Figueroa, hey Marcellus, um, can this technology supersede a passport document? So supersede or augment? <laughs> um, well, what do you think, Chris? Do you want to say that one? I, I, wouldn't it be simpler if you know right now you already pay with your phone in the shops? Why do I need? You know, I don't take my credit card out. You know, why on the border control do I need to take my passport out? I have my phone in my hand anyway. So yeah. you know, up. Absolutely, it, it can absolutely be on the same strengths and validity as my passport. And yeah, yeah we, we've seen, um, well, we've had a lot of interest from kind of the airline border force type organizations asking the same thing. And the, probably the best way to think of it is that um, you know, your passport is printed, it, it, it's, it's on sort of paper. So paper is the bearer. And yes, it's got a chip in it as well. But that's the bearer of the data. And what a digital credential is, it's just another bearer, right? Uh, you're putting the same data into a thing and wrapping it in some clever cryptography. Um, and in many ways, it's kind of almost better than the physical thing. Well, for um, one thing, you can use it remotely, right? So oh, well, a physical, go, yeah. physical passport is only useful if someone can physically inspect it. Um, but a, a credential that represents the passport can be used remotely. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, a passport, the physical document is an all or nothing proposition. If I hand that over at a, at a bar, for example, some of that, and all the person is interested in is not even my date of birth, but just uh, am I over a certain age? Um, they've got on there uh, my, my resident status, my address, they've got a whole load of biographical information that's irrelevant. Um, and even with simpler digital identity schemes that, that just take a facsimile of that passport and, and share it digitally, um, I'm still oversharing and creating a, a sort of toxic wake of, of data behind me. So this brings us back to that point about safe credentials. It's, it's not enough to just digitize a physical document. Um, you really need to imbue it with these, uh, these capabilities that allow you to share that only the information that's relevant for a particular transaction and do so safely. Yeah, and the, the worst thing would be to, to kind of create a new global super cookie that tracks you everywhere, right? That would be like just uh, you know we'll have stepped backwards many 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 times if we did that chris you were going to say something there's a great story on the questions from sherry kaiserman uh, on on her son uh getting a, a having a, a fraud on the bank account when opening a bank account 
there was already a bank account in, in his name. You know, that, that's a great use case uh, in, in our situation now with remoteness also that James is bringing up. You know, if I have a verifiable credential, my passport has a verifiable credential, I can remotely prove to my bank that I'm I and they can open a bank account for me. Right now, I need to physically turn up. You know, that's quite hard for, for all of us right now. Yeah, but you know, I, this is this is um, you know, we call it trust at a distance. And since the COVID nightmare, um, the the interest in SSI as a way to achieve trust at a distance has just skyrocketed. So, you know, medical consultations, you know, you, you want to see a doctor over Zoom. Well, how do you know it's your doctor? And how's the doctor know it's you? <laughs> right? How how can yeah. you find that out? Or, um, you can't go in a bank branch. So how can you do something digitally? Or employees working at home. And now we have a way to not only prove who somebody is, but also when they come back again, get them on you know, straight away with, with multi-factor authentication. And in fact, um, you covered this a bit earlier, James. Um, there's a question about what, what's the security advantage here? Um, you know, it's all multi-factor by default. So do you just want to dive into that a little bit more, James? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think so. There's there's a couple of elements to it. I mean, the security advantage number one in replacing either you know physical documents, which are um, you know, in some cases quite easy to uh, tamper with or, or straight out and fake, um, especially when you're you're trying to remotely inspect them, um, but also conventional authentication methods like usernames and passwords. Um, replacing that with asymmetric cryptography and keys that are securely stored under the user's control. Um, radically changes the threat landscape, right? So the, the key itself is prohibitively difficult and expensive to guess or brute force. Um, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the storage uh, on the other end by the service provider of the, um, the necessary verification key to identify you um, can't be used subsequently to impersonate you. So even if uh, in the traditional username and password breaches, for example, um, where people's credentials are getting leaked and then, and then sold online. Um, someone leaked, steals your public key, it's useless. Um, it's, only, it's, it's only capable of proving that you're you. No one else can wield that against you. Um, and of course, by, uh, by using you know, modern technologies like uh, smartphones with secure storage on them and things like that, um, you can put all these capabilities in a really convenient and secure package that's, that's always with the user. Um, and, and so that's kind of the first sort of bucket of capabilities. Um, and then to address the, the point about multi-factor, um, you're right that we, we touched on this briefly earlier, but um, you know, Chris made the point really elegantly as well. Um, you know, the, in many ways, the phone or the, the cryptographic keys stored on the phone, um, that's still all just one factor. That's something that you have. Um, but you know, typically, you're, uh, you're unlocking that device with, uh, with a pin code or with a, with a biometric or something. So you're bringing another factor uh, into that. Uh, into that particular transaction. Um, but this is not as simple as just, uh, am I in control of that key or not? Remember, we're bringing in third party assertions as well. So all the signals like the, the fraud signals, things that a, a reliant party would typically use um, kind of behind the scenes, um, the user can be in the mix in those transactions now. So I can bring in real time assertions from a biometric service provider that say, no, no, I've verified that um, the person holding that particular device really looks like James um, and definitely appears to be alive at this moment. Um, and they can provide a real time credential for that, that you can share along with the credential that you're using to prove that, um, by the way, you're the specific James that lives in London um, and has this date of birth and so on and so forth. So you're bringing together both traditional and non-traditional authentication factors um, into, into one package. And it, it can be tailored to a number of different um, uh, levels of, uh, of assertion, depending on what you, what you actually need for the use case. Yeah, perfect. And, and the, um, the other key thing about this stuff is that all of the open, all the code for those, these amazing protocols is sitting there open source, right? Yeah. So this is not like you're stuck down a proprietary thing. I, I can't use you know, Google Authenticator to log in with a Microsoft Thing and, and vice versa, because they've all made the, these silos. But here we've got, a bit like the internet, you've got a bunch of open source protocols that anyone can use, right? Which, mm -hmm. um, which is a bit of a game changer, because anyone can develop an app, right? We have an app called Connect Me. Um, yeah. The Trinsic guys have got an app. Uh, the Esatis guys have got an app. Um, and getting them, you know, interoperability based on the open source protocols is, is a key thing that the whole industry is working on at the moment. But anyone can develop something. 
Andy, it's it's such an important point. You know, I, I think we you know we often throw shade at the identity providers like like Facebook and Google and what have you for, for consumer applications. Chris was right to point out that the federation itself is not is not inherently bad, and actually, um, you know that that trade off of um, you know convenience for privacy um, is for many people it feels reasonable. Um, and you know, would you? Would you rather be fully responsible for your own security footprint, or would you rely rather rely on the large and very well-paid security operations team of one of the internet giants? Right? There's there's good reasons to, to believe that, um, that they'll do a better job of looking at, um, after it for you. But the problem is, um, number one, alignment of incentives around business models. Right? I mean, they're 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 there primarily to surveil you and, and sell access to your attention, um, and that that isn't necessarily why you signed up for that service in the first place. Um, and number two, because of that, um, they're not well incented to let you leave. Um, and so while they'll often use open interoperable standards, um, it's basically a land grab to see how many users under management they can each get. Um, and that ends up leading to some quite undesirable downstream effects. And so, you know, we, we, we talk about it as if it's a, a point of, of principle. This, oh, isn't it great to have open interoperable standards? But the benefits are quite practical, actually. It means that that either as an individual or as a relying party participating in this ecosystem, you're not beholden to a business model that gets foisted on you that isn't compatible with either your own business or with your values, right? And that's probably the first time um, that we've really had the ability to make that choice without an unacceptable trade-off in, in some of the other dimensions like, like convenience and security. Yeah. So that's, that's why I personally believe it's, it's a true game changer. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Okay, um, we've got a, a couple more minutes. Chris, one for you now. Um, a, a bit aligned, actually, to that. Um, do you think governments will be the main source of verifi verifiable identity and credentials? And would this encourage the surveillance of people? Or should we expect um, a scenario similar to TLS certificate authorities with credential verifiers being the equivalent of certificate authorities? And that's from Luke. A uh, good, good, good question, Luke, uh, and, and it ties into exactly the same. You know, we, we were saying that identity providers with their data and land graph, you know, government, it, you know, they need to hold information about their citizen, yes, but they shouldn't know when I use that information. So if I walk up uh, at the border control right now and pull my passport out uh, in, in, say, uh, it, a European company, uh, country somewhere, they will check my passport uh, and they will check against the revoke list of that government, but they will not inform my issuing government that I use this password. So there's a revoke list that it's checked against. I check the validity of passport based on the chip and everything and let me in or not based on their trust framework. And that's the same with the verifiable credential. You know, government can not check the use of it, they can revoke a verifiable credential, they can revoke my digital passport, but they cannot check where I used it. Yeah, so that's the key thing, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's part of the safe credentials um, tests we have, is that the, the verifier shouldn't need to contact the issuer, because as soon as they do, then the issuer knows everywhere you're going, right? Um, and that is a, is a massive privacy breach. And just like you say, I could use my passport to go and get gym membership, to prove something about myself. That's not, none of the government's business, right? Nor should it be. Um, I'm just using something to prove something about myself. Um, and uh, also if, just if, for, if you wouldn't Luke, be oversharing, if you wouldn't well, be yeah, exactly. I mean, by they don't need to know where I was born to get a gym membership. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and the other thing actually for Luke, you'd be interested, Luke, that uh, a number of the um, stewards of the sovereign network are actually some of the world's biggest certificate authorities uh, for this this very reason um i think we might have time for one more so let me just have a little scroll through see if i can find a um a bit of a peachy one here um one second okay so we did a bit on losing wallets and things actually let's do yeah let's just cover this one this is from someone called anon so uh, hello there anon uh, last question, uh, James, over to you. Uh, is the SSI wallet a physical thing? Does it need to be stored on a physical thing like a phone or USB stick? Um, if it's an actual device, what happens if it gets lost? So we could go down into the weeds on this, but somebody else mm. is also asking about identity hubs 
think probably somebody from Microsoft asking about identity hubs versus <laughs> versus mm -hmm. wallet and things. I uh, what's the, the latest on on that? Um, maybe James first and Chris. Yeah, I, I love it. We've got uh, got someone who's respecting their privacy in the audience. Uh, anonymous questions that what it's yeah. all about. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and look, it's a good point because in all of the examples we talked about, um, we described the wallet as you know something that the individual has with them. It's typically on a phone, things like that. Um, and you know, we we believe that is uh, probably the the optimal use case, just because we orchestrate so many uh, facets of our digital experience using this device. It's a very intimate sort of personal device, um, and so you know, as, as Chris said, just like you pay with it and you you, you book your hairdresser's appointment. You text your loved ones with it, um, you know, proving who you are feels very natural. Um, but it's it's in no way um, sort of a baked in design assumption at all. Like the the wallet is uh, is a logical construct rather than a, a physical one, really. So it can be an app, uh, it could be several apps on the phone actually, um, or it could be a service in the cloud or, or some combination um, of of the two things. Um, you know, it is it's probably most secure if. The, the cryptographic material and data sort of exists only at rest in the secure element on a device. Um, but that brings with it some convenience trade-offs, um, you know, particularly around you know, lost and, and stolen devices and things like that. Um, so all of that has to be baked in. And I think it's, it's worth acknowledging that, you know, while there are some, some pretty good answers to that, um, you know, Chris made the point about user experience being a challenge. And, and it's true that, you know, most of the solutions in the market today um, still have a bit of a way to go um, before they have, you know, layman's answers to, to all of those edge cases so yeah. you know i think for a number of cases um it'll make sense to use you know cloud-based digital agents identity hubs uh, personal data stores and, and that sort of family of technologies um to take certain actions on your behalf right um you know i might not want to be involved in every single transaction involving my personal data particularly if i've already given my permission and so um in those situations you can imagine a uh, an autonomous agent or a digital butler that's that's handling the the noise for me as sort of only escalating really important things for my attention um, and so i really think as the as the industry matures um, we'll start to see kind of a hybrid approach there where you've got a, a number of different strategies employed that are appropriate for different users and, and different scenarios yeah very cool it's important actually not to forget here that um wallets aren't just for people right they're for things too that's right, <laughs> and, that's right. That, and for organizations and um you know, those probably be very different user experiences and different places mm. to store them. You know, you put the, the wallet inside the ECU of the car so it can prove it can go through a toll booth or charge up somewhere. There's a world of other use cases there. Uh, Chris, last word uh, from you on this one. Yes. And it, it, it's about the user's choice also. You know, uh, the user should have the choice of being able to back up their credentials and, and choose the security levels on that backup or not back it up and go back to the issues when they need it. And, and that should be the user's choice. And we, we see examples right now, you know, if you have a block, a coin wallet, wallet that you obviously want some backup and there's complex backups and simple backup. And you make the choice of how you back up your data and, and use it. Yeah, yeah, there's some really good business opportunities with this new world. You know, banks are the, you know, the custodians of my money, which is value to me, and my credentials will add value to me. So maybe they can help me with backup and recovery, you know, and all that kind of thing. So lots and lots of new business opportunities come up as well. Okay, so we'll we'll wrap it there. We've gone 15 minutes over the hour. We've got a whole bunch of people that stayed on. Thank you for staying on. You're all fantastic. Um, our next webinar is coolness virtual worlds gaming it's going to be epic that's on the 30th so please join us for that uh, james and chris thanks very much very engaging stuff um, we'll be uh, putting a recording of the webinar up on the website so you'll see that as well um, and until then thank you and goodbye okay thank you thank you Andrew. thank you james